Welcome to, the, to today's live interaction with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants. We will begin promptly at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to hold tight until then, we're just about to start. Audio information, if you're having trouble, is located on the screen now. Hi everyone and welcome to a live interaction with Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants and NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Today we will be paddling in Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary and learning all about the recreation and shipwrecks in that sanctuary. But before we get started and in diving into the presentation, I'm going to turn it over to Jesse, the host for Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants, to give us a little bit of a rundown of what today's interaction is going to look like. Hi, Jesse. Hi there, Hannah. Thank you so much for having me in. I really appreciate this. Uh, for everyone who's tuning in, you may have seen one of our joint Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants NOAA presentations before. If not, I want to do a little bit of a walkthrough of who, what we're all about and how today is going to work. So first, Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants, we're a digital education nonprofit and we connect scientists and explorers from around the world with kids through digital learning sessions. So if you go to our website, exploringbytheseat.com, you'll see all just past and upcoming sessions, promo with a, a, one of our, our key partners standing beside a volcano, which is pretty fun. And then you have this join our newsletter list right here. So our newsletter goes out to 7,500 educators around the world, highlights all our upcoming sessions, any of our campaigns and how you can take part with your classrooms. And then it's really easy to join at the bottom, all upcoming lessons. Uh, we typically ramp up big in a big way come September, so check back then for a whole slew of programs on all manner of scientists and explorers. You can also go to our YouTube channel uh, and our videos, uh, where every single program we've ever done is there on the YouTube channel. In fact, you can see our last two NOAA sessions right here and right here with Hannah both taking part, so it's very exciting. So today, uh, again, Hannah's going to be the, the master of ceremonies and highlighting all our amazing speakers. I'm going to be behind the scenes and guiding the Q&A. So there are two ways you can take part in Q&A. One is in the question part of the GoToWebinar. So you'll see that at the bottom of your control panel on the right. And the second is Slido. So Slido is a really great tool. It is a Q&A and polling software. So if you go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and we will put this in the chat bar for you, and enter the event code SHIPWRECK, so you'll be able to join the event, uh, see our polls as they come up through the broadcast, and share your questions and upvote your favorites. So by doing that, it's just a great way to take part. Uh, so you can check in on all the questions we're going to be sharing today. It's really exciting, and we hope you guys will participate with that. So that's it for me. Uh, I just wanted to give you guys a chance to understand how we're going to be going today, and I'll turn it back to Hannah to blow your mind with all the cool stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much. I am going to get us started by showing a little bit of an overview of NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Now, we're a network of 16 marine protected areas that can serve over 600,000 square miles of marine waters. We span from Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Washington to the Florida Keys to a freshwater site that we'll learn all about today in Thunder Bay and all the way out in the Pacific to places like American Samoa and Papahanaumokuakea. 
Now to get us started, I want us to start with an interaction on Slido. So Jesse's going to drop the Slido link into the chat room. And if you want to click on the link there, or if you were able to bring it up as he was introducing you to the platform earlier, that would be great. I want to check out and see how many of you are watching this live stream with other people. Event code is shipwreck, by the way. We got our first participant. So someone's found it, so that's fantastic. But I have it both in the chat bar right now. So slido.com, you can click on. Event code, as Hannah said, is shipwreck. And of course, there's gonna be many polls uh, coming over the next uh, hour. So plenty of opportunities to take part, even if you can't find it just yet. Awesome. Well, we can get back to that then, and I'll continue our tour of the National Marine Sanctuaries. We're gonna start in the most Northwest corner of the continental United States, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, where they protect pristine tidal ecosystems and deep sea corals. Further south in California, we have Greater Fairlawns National Marine Sanctuary. In this photo, you can see some shorebirds. Also in Northern California is Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, which protects deep sea corals. Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, also in Northern California, protects a biodiversity of marine life, including this elephant seal. Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary is the other sanctuary in California, located 30 miles off the shore of Santa Barbara, protecting kelp forest ecosystems and this Garibaldi right here, which happens to be the state marine fish. Going further west, we have Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument, which is one of the largest marine conservation areas in the world, protecting some of the most charismatic species like this Hawaiian monk seal and green sea turtles. Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary, also located in Hawaii, protects the breeding grounds for humpback whales. And also in the Pacific, we have the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa, in this sanctuary, we have Big Mama, which happens to be the largest and longest living coral that's known in the ocean. We have Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, about 100 nautical miles off the coast of Galveston, Texas. In this photo, you see a moray eel. And then back south, we have Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, which protects the Florida Keys Reef Track. Going up the coast, we have Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Georgia, protecting live hard soft bottom reef ecosystems. We have our very first National Marine Sanctuary ever designated Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. Now the Monitor is a Civil War era shipwreck that's protected off the coast of North Carolina. In, we go from our very first sanctuary to our very recent, Mallows Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary located in the Potomac River in Maryland. Now this sanctuary was just designated in November of 2019 and it protects the ghost fleet of shipwrecks. Now I bet this is a destination for our paddleboarder Leslie as these shipwrecks lie partially submerged under the water. Going further north, we have Stellweg and Bank National Marine Sanctuary known for its amazing whale watching and bird watching in Massachusetts Bay. And then the sanctuary we're going to learn all about today, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which protects over 200 shipwrecks in Lake Huron off the coast of Alpena, Michigan. So now that we've done our virtual tour, I wanna know if any of you have visited a National Marine Sanctuary before. So again, this is in the Slido. So Slido can be accessed from the link in the chat with the event code SHIPWRECK. So, so far, Hannah, every single person who submitted has visited a National Marine Sanctuary. We've got a lot of big fans today joining us, which is great. Awesome. That is really great. I wonder uh, where, they're, where they've been. Hopefully Thunder Bay, maybe we've got some local participants in today's live interaction. So I want to tell you a little bit more about what National Marine Sanctuaries actually do. So we protect sea giants from this whale shark here in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary to small sea life like the reef fish and corals that are on many of our reefs across the system. 
We are protecting places with abundant biodiversity. We're protecting places that provide shelter to some marine mammals. And we also protect maritime heritage, which we'll learn a lot more about today. We're offering resource protection so that these special places are around for generations to come. These are our special marine places, and you'll learn that from Leslie today. These are our places to paddle, our places to fish, to snorkel, to boat, to surf. These places are really just all ours. And with that, I'm going to introduce you to our presenters today. This happens to be a photo of both of them in this picture. I'll let them explain more, but they're together in Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Leslie Dorth is a paddle boarder in the sanctuary, and Stephanie Gondula is the research coordinator with Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. I'm going to turn over controls to Stephanie to introduce us to Thunder Bay and today's presentation. Thank you so much, Hannah. You're welcome. Well, back to that, that picture real quick that you showed. I'm so happy you found that uh, photo by David Ruck of us exploring Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in yet another way. There's so many ways to get into our sanctuaries. And I'm sure Leslie agrees that was one of our, our favorite seasons where we Alert got from go to meeting v10.11.1. My computer talking to have been made the presenter. Thank you, computer. Anyhow, so we were um we got to row in a uh, replica of a historic Mackinac vessel, and we that was such a a, a treat. Uh, the Heritage 23 folks built that. Uh, with a group of, of students up to build it and they, they let us borrow it and row it. Do you remember rowing the, in the sanctuary? Oh my gosh. It, it was such a treat because you had the history while you were on top of the water and you were you know basically rolling over it, rowing over it. Yes, it, it was great fun. Um, but we're talking about uh, I guess all of our shallow shipwrecks and uh, the different ways we can experience them. And so the way it'll go today for the next about 40 minutes is I'm gonna share a little bit about the history of Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary and the significance of the collection that we are here to protect. And then I'm gonna talk about five very specific shipwrecks uh, that Leslie frequents all the time. Uh, I'll, sh I'll share a little bit of the history and we'll get to see some amazing uh, aerial photography, uh, a lot of photo mosaics, some brilliant images, never before seen a lot of these um, of the shipwrecks while Leslie shares her experiences paddling over them. And of course, there'll be questions throughout. And, and remember, please, uh, this is interactive. We'd love to hear from our audiences out there. So Hannah did go over the amazing National Marine Sanctuary, uh, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the sites all over our country. And we are the only one in freshwater so far and in the heart of the Great Lakes. I've got a red box around the Great Lakes right there and we're gonna zoom right in. Stephanie, I think we're having trouble viewing your screen. I just see a white image. If you wanna okay. try restarting by going over to the show button and selecting the window again. Okay, here we go. Didn't like that. Either. It's still white. So do you, oh, there we go. We're all good. Perfect. We see a map of the Great Lakes, well, a photo of the Great Lakes. Excellent. Okay, well, I'll back up because I want to show you my little square. So if you are if you haven't been to the Great Lakes, you have an idea of where we are on the continent. And then zooming into the Great Lakes, Lake Huron right there in the middle. And then zooming in even further to Alpena, Michigan. This is on the northwest corner of Lake Huron, the northeast corner of, of Lower Peninsula of Michigan and we're 4,300 square miles. And I think this image right here gives you an idea of the breadth of resources, cultural resources that we are charged with protecting. We estimate uh, that there are at least 100 shipwrecks yet to be found in the 4,300 square miles of sanctuary waters. And we have identified, what you see here are the identified ones, we have identified 99 shipwrecks. So exciting that we're still out there looking for shipwrecks. So you might wonder why so many shipwrecks in this area? And if I back up again to give you an idea of uh, where we are again in the Great Lakes, like I said, we're smack dab in the middle. So historically and, and today, this is a high traffic area. Any vessel traveling on the Great Lakes, whether they're going north, upbound or south, uh, downbound generally, really has to pass by Thunder Bay. So it's, it's a high 
traffic area. So lots of, a lot of those dots on the map there are shipwreck are due to collisions. And another reason we have so many shipwrecks in the area, I always like to say they don't call it Thunder Bay for nothing. Uh, the Great Lakes are known for terrible storms, sometimes 30 foot high waves and 90 mile an hour winds and uh, sudden fogs and all, really terrible weather can happen here in the Great Lakes, big waves that can take ships down with them. So we've got weather, we've got um, high uh, frequency of shipping, lots of traffic. And then finally, the area just around Thunder Bay is known for its shallow shoals. So rocky reefs, piles of rocks that are perfect for ripping apart a ship's hull, whether it's a, a wooden hull or, or a metal hull. So lots and lots of shipwrecks, but we're not just special because of the quantity um, the number, the sheer number of, of archaeological sites in the 4,300 square miles, it's also the diversity. Here we have one of my favorite shipwreck sites to dive. This is the wooden schooner Northwestern. It's, it's a little bit too deep to see from the paddleboard. It's a, about 140 feet deep, amazing site to, to uh, scuba dive. And you could see the state of preservation possible there in that wooden schooner. And then we have the shallow wrecks. Here we have a snorkeler enjoying um, one of our shallow shipwreck sites. I believe this is the, the Albany. And next we have a, a huge steel freighter. This is the uh, German freighter Nordmeer, the most recent big shipwreck in sanctuary waters. This freighter ran aground in 1966. So one of those groundings, no lives lost, um, but a big loss of, of, of property for sure. This is an amazing snorkel site, 500 feet long, only 30 feet deep and you can scuba dive it as well as you can see the diver enjoying the site there. So the diversity is amazing. And here we have another snorkeler enjoying the Portland, which we're gonna take a, a deeper look at here in a minute. So we've got lots of shipwrecks, so quantity, we've got variety, really giving us a, a good example of uh, what we call the shipwreck century. So uh, over a hundred years of when we went from paddle wheelers to those huge steel freighters. And you can see everything in Thunder Bay. Back to another reason it's so special is the, the state of preservation possible here in Lake Huron. The cold fresh water really is like a, a schooner deep freeze. This is the schooner Defiance sank in 1854 in one of those collisions. And its masts are truly standing upright like that about 90 feet in the water column. So a, a really, really rich uh, collection of archeological sites. And so here we are for our first question. And, and I did mention this a couple times. How many square miles is Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary? All right, so we're getting some answers for you. We've got three people so far. A bunch of people think 448. And one person's really keen on 4300, so 10 times as much almost, very exciting. Um, but yes, for everyone again, you can check in uh, with the code SHIPWRECK. We've got at least 12 participants. Oh, more now. We've got 84. No one says 4,800, but we've got some good numbers on 448 and 4,300. So you might have to tell us. Confirm. Okay, I will tell you. So the answer is C. The answer is 4,300 square miles. The um, individual who said 448, they would have been right prior to 2014. Uh, that was the 448 square miles was the original uh, sanctuary designation back in the year 2000. In 2014, after some uh, community and grassroots effort, we were really excited to expand to that 4,300 square miles. But now I think it's time to, to start paddling and to really get into our sanctuary and explore these shipwrecks, these shallow shipwrecks um, up close and personal. The first shipwreck we're going to talk about is the Loretta. We're gonna head um, south to north. The, the sanctuary encompasses three counties um, from south to north. It's uh, Alcona County, and then Alpena County, and then the, the northern county is Presque Isle County. So here we are in Alcona, this is the, the Loretta. Um, as you can see, you can see the, the surface of the water there. The Loretta caught fire while tied up at the dock. So just imagine it's a, a wooden dock and it's a wooden vessel. So what would you do? You would you know, cut the ties and tow it out into the lake and let it sink and burn and sink. And so that's what happened. A lot, uh, even though it is a shallow site, there's still a lot of machinery and a lot of the, the hull yet to see. And here is one of my favorite images of the Loretta and I'll let Leslie take it from here and share her experiences paddling on the Loretta and what we're seeing here. And one of the really amazing things about Thunder Bay is all of this is within an arm's reach. This is probably one of the 
furthest to paddle to, I mean, it's three quarters, I believe, of a mile to a mile offshore. Um, but it's, I mean, there's a put in right at the park. So you can go in, in this shot, we're with a couple of kayakers. You can see one is tied up to the buoy, um, just to give us all kind of an area of where to shoot for. But uh, that day, the waters weren't, ex you know, really calm, but they were certainly paddle paddle worthy. Uh, I'm a fair weather paddler, so I'm not going to be out there in three foot waves. I actually get seasick on my paddle board, <laughs> so it's got to be pretty calm. That's probably smart that you're not out there in the big waves that, you know, take some of these ships down. No, no, obviously I'm on a raft, so. Um, but we've even got a snorkeler in the water and that's kind of one of the beautiful things about the shallow shipwrecks is you can get off your kayak or your paddleboard and explore it so i'll take my snorkel gear out on my paddleboard tie it up to the buoy the paddleboard that is and then jump off and go explore so you've got a very easy um, non-motorized way to get out it's very quiet and peaceful and you can explore I like this image because you can see that the snorkeler is is just wearing their swimming trunks, so the water looks pretty warm. Yeah, it was a beautiful day, actually. We were out for quite a while. You know, and you can encompass your whole day around one of these. You can be out on the water, you can go in and have a picnic and then go back out because the water conditions will change, but they go back to calm just as quick as they get wavy. It's true, it's a very dynamic area. I, another uh, reason I like these images that show the entire site is there still is a lot, even though it's a shallow site, it's not as intact as that schooner defiance with the mast standing upright, but there are still so many details of the ship construction that you can observe, even from the surface, dive down and get a closer look. But the, the keelson here in this, this barge Loretta was uh, so it's a wooden ship but the keelson was encased in iron and that was to protect the keelson when they were loading um heavy cargo and all a lot of these details are, are still evident just some great shots here showing what a beautiful site this is this is probably the the furthest offshore and so now we can we can head north to uh, a massive shipwreck site, the William P. Rend, uh, another uh, barge. This was built in 1888, sank in 1917 in, in a storm. And this site is one of the most visited by many different um, means of recreation. You can go out there on a paddleboard like Leslie has, kayak, scuba divers go out there for uh, their you know, training sites. What's another thing that's interesting about the Rend is that, like I said, it's long, long history. It had many, many accidents. In fact, it, it had so many accidents, it sort of had a reputation of being a, a bad luck ship, the food ship. That's where you see this, this article here. But the, the site is a great scuba diving site, in addition to being a uh, glass bottom boat viewing site. The glass bottom boat Lady Michigan yes. visits there quite a bit. Yeah. Here's one of my favorite shots looking at the glass bottom boat. And I think this gives you an idea of the, the size, the massive size of the William P. Rend. I mean, that's almost 300 feet long. The Lady Michigan, 64 feet long. So, the, and this site's still out there uh, waiting for you to visit. Scooting well, by the, the, oh, go ahead. No, if you go back to that shot, the other thing that I appreciate about it is you can see the horizon. I think people mistake the Great Lakes for inland lakes and they're tiny. This image really reminds you that it's it's a huge body of water. Yeah, it's more correctly called ocean, inland ocean or inland seas, certainly mm -hmm. bigger than the lakes. So up next, one of my favorite stories, uh, the Portland. Uh, so this was a wooden schooner and it's got a great entry. I'll let um, Leslie talk more about the, the sandy entry there. I'll focus on the history. Um, so the Portland, it was October of 1877, and the Portland was one of your canal schooners. So right around this time, the 1870s or 1890s, there were thousands of these canalers uh, scooting around the Great Lakes. They're like our semi-trucks of today. And uh, they were called canalers because they were all built very, very, you know, to the almost identical proportions in order to maximize their cargo space as they went through the canals. They had to 
be able to fit through while still maximizing cargo space. So canalers were very busy running around. This one was hauling a cargo of salt and it came upon a storm and, and ran aground. It wasn't totally wrecked yet though. So the captain got off the vessel and was headed to town to telegraph uh, the owners and, and get some advice on next steps. What should they do with the vessel? Left the first mate in charge as they're hung up on the, the sandbar and the rocks there. A, another vessel came by, a salvage vessel and said, you know, there's another storm. The captain of that vessel, I believe was the Leviathan said to the first mate, there's another storm coming why don't you let me pull you off the, the sand here and get you guys free before the storm comes? First mate wasn't sure what to do. He's like, well, I don't have permission to do that because, of course, it would there would be a fee. And the mm -hmm. Leviathan captain's like, I really recommend it. The first mate decided against it. The storm came and ended up making it a, a complete wreck. So the Portland still sits there. And here's some of the shots, uh, photo mosaics here of the side of the Portland. It's really an incredible site to paddle. One, it's so easy to get to. The parking area is about a quarter mile from the shore, so it's nothing of a walk if you're portaging in your kayak or board. Um, I started out on my kayak on this site, but I can't get in and out of my kayak anymore because I'm shrinking, so that wall now is pretty tall. But the paddle board is my favorite to do shipwrecks, but just because you can really get close. you can I can lay down on it and hang my hands in the water, and it really does feel like you're touching this one. And I don't know, Steph, if we've got a photo of the lagoon, too. Is that part of our... Actually, I don't, I don't think I have one of those. So if I may, this one is in the lake, but then there's a bit of a beach, and then there's a lagoon, for back, lack of a better term. Um, and part of it is over there, up over the beach area. So it's amazing season to season to watch how the land changes and the relationship of the ship. It also um, really taught me, because I'm not a shipwreck hunter, I'm not a big history buff, but having these at our fingertips here in Northeast Michigan, I, I learned because it's fascinating. You want to know the story behind all of this. Um, and just watching the changes of this and you find pieces of the shipwreck, you know, in the woods walking and you can really begin to appreciate how to protect them. And it's not supposed to end up a dining table. It really should be preserved because the next person will come along and be interested and, you know, maybe get a peaked interest in history. Yes, uh, the protection part is huge. I We really have worked hard um, to work with the community to have folks engaged with these wrecks and then just like Leslie they're going to want to protect them as well for future generations for tomorrow's visitors to these shipwreck sites and a part of that protection uh, has been the photo documentation of these sites uh, particularly the Portland here um, Brian Dort who is responsible for these amazing uh, the drone photography and the photo mosaics has gone out regularly at the same time of the year for the past few years. So every April and then every October, he has done a full photo mosaic of the Portland site, including the lagoon that's in shore uh, that Leslie mentioned. And that is a, a excellent tool because these, the, the timbers that we can measure within a, you know millimeters and really document how this shallow dynamic site is changing over time. So it's, it's really, helping the work of our archaeological team. So it's it's citizen science at work right here. Uh, while Leslie's out paddling and, and enjoying the day, Brian's um, taking uh, documentation that's very worthwhile to the sanctuary. And this one is incredibly accessible, one in that it's shallow. It's what, seven feet maybe, depending on the lake levels. But it's also near the shore. You can really just walk out to it and and be a part of history. Yes, I like this one because of the the sandy entrance. It's it's like you said, mm -hmm. it is definitely one. It, I I think it's the easiest site. It's 20 minute drive from Alpena. Uh, you can spend a couple hours there, have lunch on the on the beach, and it, it's a beautiful site. Okay, I think we have another Slido question here, and I I hope I mentioned this. I believe I did. What what just once though? So you had to have been paying attention. What was the schooner Portland carrying when it sank? I don't, I don't. 
We have a mix so far. Six, oh, now people are starting to pour in. So salt is our increasingly our most popular answer. No one says live chicken. So everyone disagrees that there were a ton of chickens there. But we're very salty. We're a salty bunch today. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that because yes, it, it truly was salt. And I only mentioned it once, so I'm thrilled to hear that folks are listening to the details. There is another shipwreck in Sanctuary Waters, uh, actually off of Alpena here, right in Thunder Bay that did have a load of live chicken. So it's not unheard of. Okay, here we have, I think this might be Leslie's favorite site. We sure have some amazing photos <laughs> uh, that Brian Dort took of the site Albany. This is an old, old vessel. Um, the picture is not of the Albany that you see here. This is another very, very famous side wheeler of the comet. So it looks similar. Um, built in 1846, you know, early on and lost in 1853. Uh, it was carrying over 200 passengers, provisions and supplies. And once again, uh, the, the weather got the best of it and it went aground uh, during a storm, very similar to the Portland. Uh, the passengers, stayed on the vessel the entire night uh but no loss of lives after the you know weathering an evening on a, a grounded ship they were rescued the next morning so no lives lost they stripped most of the the wreckage or most of the the um cargo off of the the albany the steamer albany but did leave some amazing uh hull features massive massive timbers that you can see leslie paddling over here now this is actually one of my favorites it's that day was incredibly clear the water was as calm as it can get it was as though there wasn't water there so for me as a paddler it was as close as i could get without getting wet um, and you can see well you probably can't tell because it's a linear shot of course but um you're in a protected area. I'm sort of in a cove in this area. So the, we were actually going to paddle and drone a different shipwreck that morning. But the water, the, the lake was too rough. So we ended up coming here. Um, and what's fascinating to me as it, Brian's in the air with the drone taking the shots, but I can't actually see the shore from my vantage point, because it was incredibly foggy that day. I was out there and the fog rolled in. And I was comfortable because I know he had me. We have um, walkie talkies back and forth. So I know he's got me and I've got, you know, but that actually isn't a cloud or fog in that per previous <laughs> picture. The joke between us is, that's a, a layer of bacon aroma because somebody was cooking bacon and this is a heavy residential area and it was early morning. <laughs> this, this shipwreck will always remind me of bacon and it's just so stupid because it has nothing to do with bacon. <laughs> I love and it that is one of my favorites because it is so uh, easy to get to. It's a little bit more of a hike. I think it's three quarters of a hike. So you've got to portage your gear into where you put in. Um, but the paddle out there is nothing. I think it's 300 yards to get to it. And it's just fascinating to float by and see the timbers. Yes, see, this is another great example of that clarity in the water Leslie was talking about. I mean, it, it, if you didn't have the ripples in the water there, it, it could be like glass. It truly is so clear out there. And the visibility at these wrecks, I, I think 90, I've never seen it anything but visibility like this. On the lower left side of the image there, you can see some of the, the ship construction features that really stand out to me uh, as a, an archaeologist that's a a T-shaped wooden timber down there. They're called lodging knees. Those really stand out as, as distinctive. Um, it, they support the beam, or sorry, they support the deck of, of the, the vessel. And I love seeing those little details. And if you, you look closer and closer, you can see the, the joinery and how these massive timbers were put together. Um, I, you can visit these sites over and over and, and get these clues to our, our American history. And this Another. one again is shallow, isn't it? Five feet? Super shallow. It's yeah, it's easy, easy snorkel. Um, and even if you're not comfortable diving down, free diving to, to closer, as you can see with the visibility, you don't need to. You can float at the top, uh, literally hang it. You don't have to get wet, like Leslie said. Yeah. 
but yet if you do you know you can touch more than likely right right lot, i was just out here not too long ago at the site of the albany um we mentioned briefly mooring buoys we're going to talk about that a little bit more um but there's also quite a few fish different types of fish out there oh, yeah. you can't see the fish right now but um fish love structure and so there'll be there'll be lots of fish life on these shipwreck sites Hey, and there she is, about ready to jump in. Do you jump in here, Leslie? Yeah, it was really hard not to, but. <laughs> okay, and here we have the Joseph S. Bay. This is the fifth um, shipwreck that we're gonna talk, and final shipwreck we're gonna talk about today. But do remember, there's lots more to explore. Uh, the Joseph S. Bay is uh, another massive shipwreck site. It's uh, the furthest north one in our collection today. It's off of 40 Mile Point uh, Lighthouse. So beautiful grounds there. And it is massive. It, in fact, it's probably the, the pretty much the largest site that you can get to from easily get to from shore. Just look at the for scale there, Leslie, little Leslie on her paddleboard and the massive uh, Joseph S. Fay. This is another one that uh, in October of 1905 that uh, ran aground in a storm. In fact, it was uh, towing another vessel and ran aground. They had to, to um, sever part the tow line and the, the ship was broken up. Uh, the first mate, unfortunately, did uh, perish in the sinking of this wreck. So it is, um, there was one loss of life here. If you can have an opportunity to visit the 40 Mile Point Lighthouse, it, it truly is a, a, a maritime classroom because it has the massive shipwreck site, short distance offshore. It has some shipwreck, uh, some of the shipwreck left on the beach. There's a lighthouse, there's a foghorn signal building, a, a, the wheelhouse of a freighter. It's, it's one of my favorite spots on the Great Lakes to visit. And here we have the, the mooring buoy off in the, the top left there, which makes, I mean, visiting these sites so much easier. Leslie, do you often tie up to the mooring buoy even with your paddleboard? I do, especially if it's a calm day. Um, believe it or not, I take a book with me with my paddleboard. So if I just need a break, I'll tie up so I don't float away. But um, it's incredibly important to know what color the mooring buoys are. Um, and these actually give me some security, right? Because you have it and you know it's attached to a known item. Um, I have a, an incredible, I'll admit, open water anxiety that I work really hard to get over. So I went out one time uh, with my paddleboard. This is one of the first, and I was being so brave and I was in the bay and I was gonna go take my snorkel gear and dive off my paddleboard and explore. And I saw a buoy, so I just assumed it was a NOAA buoy, but it wasn't. It was actually the freshwater intake for the city of Alpena, <laughs> which you do not want to dive. <laughs> not anyway, as, a, as a shipwreck, not as interesting as a shipwreck for sure. Not at all as interesting, a little terrifying really, but um, so know your buoys. <laughs> yes, very good advice from an expert paddler. Yeah. Uh, this I think it, and it, Brian definitely has won prizes for his photography, but this with the, the ripples going out, I think is just absolutely stellar. Um, the Joseph S. Fay was hauling iron ore. In fact, as you visit the site, you can you can still see some of that cargo. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, you can really see here how the, the vessel is still is sitting on an even keel. So that stern and the, the stern machinery is all still intact and upright. Uh, an amazing, amazing intact shipwreck. And here, this gives you an idea of, of that whole maritime classroom I was talking about with the lighthouse. Um, also gives you an idea of the, the paddle, you know, the distance to, to paddle out there, which it's not bad, right, Leslie? Yeah, this one's about 300 yards. Okay. okay. So those more- Where the buoys, Portland, what we were talking about, that's um, very close. That was 250 feet. That's walkable from the shore. Yes, Portland's the, that's the easy one. That's the one to start with. That's your be beginner yeah. store accessible site for sure. And this this image is just so peaceful. How off, How long will you spend out there at a shipwreck site, Leslie? You know, I could spend, because you get into it, you start to become a part of the shipwreck and I can paddle up and down. Um, I could easily lose an hour of my day just exploring it because one piece of the shipwreck leads you to another and 
you know, the fay is just so enormous and it's a little deeper too. So you've really got to focus on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this one's 20 feet down. It is, that's exactly right. Okay. It's a deeper one, but as you can see from those images, still crystal clear water Yeah, from the surface for sure. So we've been talking about the buoys and it, it really is a great resource. It's something the sanctuary works really hard to uh, make sure we communicate to folks that these mooring buoys are out there for recreational use. Um, the shipwrecks are open to visit. Of course, they're, uh, they are sometimes grave sites. They are archeological sites, they are protected. So it's against the law to disturb them, but you can visit them in all of these different ways we've talked about. Best way to do it is to check out the sanctuary shipwreck mooring map. We maintain mooring buoys on 42 sites. And um, this year we don't have the full gamut um, installed, but we do have a, a good percentage of the shallow shipwreck sites uh, moored. And if you go to this interactive map that's on our website, thunderbay.noaa.gov, you can in real time see what buoys are in place on the shipwreck sites. And you know that just makes it so much easier to visit. It's also great for, the, for tying up, of course, like Leslie mentioned, but also great for scuba divers because they can uh, they don't have to drop anchor. They can secure to the site, the dive boat, and not drop anchor and potentially damage the site. Uh, so check out our mooring buoy map. Um, there's a the history about each wreck there and also the, the GPS coordinates and uh, description of what it's like to visit the site. And, and I mean, it's our, just a, you don't have to be a paddler or a scuba diver to be a part of all of this. Um, a lot of these photos, it looks like I'm alone in this, which I would never do or recommend because the weather on the Great Lakes can change so quickly. Uh, but it's a very um, non-intimidating way to explore history around you that you might not know is there. I love that. It's a non-intimidating way to really be an adventurer. And I think that's that's really what we embrace here. And there's our partners um, across the state and, and community, local, regional governments also have some great resource about accessing these, these blue ways and these blue trails. Um, here we have the Alpena Blue Way. And here's a map of if you're more adventuresome and you wanna go out you know, on a full day rather than maybe just your lunch hour, uh, here's some trails and, a, and a great guidance on um, distances to, to different shipwreck sites. There's folks that uh, we've interacted with that have planned, you know, multi-day adventures paddling from shipwreck site to shipwreck site. Oh, I think we have the last question that I wanted to ask. Um, now, this this was a this is a, might be a challenging one because I mentioned the answer to this one very early on. What is the most recent shipwreck in sanctuary waters? Bonus if they can tell tell us the year. All right. So so far, overwhelmingly Nordmir. Every other one of the three people are sort of ifing and amming about, but Nordmir's got 60% of the vote so far. And there's no option right now to say what uh, time. So if anyone wants to put that in the chat bar, you're welcome to. But Nordmir is our winner, certainly in, in our Slido poll. Well, Jesse, you were listening, right? Do you remember what year I said it sank? Oh dear. <laughs> I I'm sorry. To to spot. <laughs> but I'm playing around with too much Slido and stuff in the back end, so do tell. Okay, we have, and coming in on GoToWebinar, we have people entering in their answer there. Everywhere from, I'm seeing a range of 1964 to 1967. How close are our attendees? They're really quite close. The answer is indeed the Nordmere 1966 ran aground. Nice. We've got a smart audience today. So that, um, Unless um, Leslie had, this is, I had to end with this image because it's absolutely one of my most favorite of Leslie um, exploring the sanctuary, so peaceful. And um, I'd like to ask Leslie if she has anything to add and then open it up to questions from our audience. I really don't have anything to add. It's just if you want to see more of the shipwreck photos that we've been able to capture, um, you can go to the site photic.zone and you'll have other photos of these shipwrecks and more to look at. I think to date, I've been on 11 wrecks. I've dropped that link in the chat as well as the link to Thunder Bay's list of shipwrecks and Thunder Bay's website. So 
You can check out all of those resources in the chat. Well, ladies, if you'd like, we can dive in with Q&A. We've already got a bunch of questions that poured in in the question bar and the go-to meeting. If people want to share questions in Slido as well, so either one of those will be monitoring them both. Um, and we really appreciate as many questions as you can send us. Another quick note, we had about 130 people consistently through the entire broadcast. I just asked people to share where they're joining from, state, province, country, what have you. So Indiana and Maine so far, and we'll hopefully have an update on, on where all our people are coming from. It's really exciting. That is exciting. Um, Hannah, is there anything from you before we dive in with questions? I think question time it is. Perfect. All right, so our first one is from Colleen, and Colleen wants to know, Leslie, how much does it cost to get the gear and the paddle boat to go out and do exploration like this? Well, actually, I researched mine a lot and went with an inflatable. That's my preference. Um, it's very portable. It's, I, it's in a backpack bag, and I can take it where I want. So I went with an inflatable. Um, but you can get them at a Costco for 300. It's just, I really researched mine. I needed it to be rugged. I needed to be able to drag it around if I was getting too tired to actually carry it. Um, they're only about 35 pounds. Mine, I think ran about $700 and that was six years ago. Fantastic. Great. Uh, a quick one while we're getting more and more questions. So we highlighted this incredible marine sanctuary today. And what a beautiful, I mean, I want to, you know, get there immediately. I think it's like a 13 hour drive from where I am. So I'm just going to get in the car the moment I finish, I think. Um, are there other places you've gone? Are there other places around the world, whether that's near the Great Lakes, other parts of them that you would recommend that are really exciting and have shipwrecks like this? Well, actually, in your neck of the woods, Jesse, just right across Saint in in Lake Huron, still, but right across the lake from us is um, Fathom Five National Park, Canadian National Park, and that has, it, I mean, really the same amazing resources and also the same um, philosophy of encouraging people to get out and explore them. Everything from the shallow sites to the very, very deep sites. All right, uh, Michelle wants to know what do what, what should I do if I find a piece of a ship on the shore? So we talked about these as being archaeological sites, places that you shouldn't really disturb in any serious way. Um, and so, what happens if a piece of them washes up? That's a, such a great question because it is it happens more than more than you'd think, um, and you want to definitely leave it in place and report it to the sanctuary. Um, we are co-managed by the state of Michigan, and so reporting it. Uh, there's actually a website that outlines everything you should do. It's not a lot, it's just, you know, leave it and report it. Um, of course, we'd love it if you took some pictures and also took a, um, a, you know, dropped a pin or wrote down your GPS coordinates with the report because it is, the, the shallow shipwreck sites are very dynamic. Uh, there's a lot of movement with waves and wind and ice and they are, they're moving. And it's uh, it's pretty fascinating to track the, how these shipwreck sites uh, the shipwreck timbers, the ship, the hulls themselves do move. So yes, leave it there and please report and document it. Well, and we've all got self, I mean, most of us have smartphones or cell phones of some kind. And when you take a photo, oftentimes the location, the geolocation is in the details of the photo. So you can get to it when you get back home and just email it to the sanctuary as well. Outstanding. Thanks, ladies. All right, Laura wants to know a very specific question for you, Leslie. Uh, can you comment on the American Union at Thompson Harbor and have you paddled out to it, if so? I actually have not done that one yet. Um, that's one I'm going to, but I haven't been on top of that one yet. Fantastic. Only, that's, a, that's a great one. I've only visited it from the, the water side, coming at it from a boat, but it's if you had the time, I think, um, Leslie, maybe we should plan an expedition out there, do a hike through Thompson's Harbor State Park, which is beautiful, absolutely beautiful area, lots to see there, and then hop in and um, it's a bit of a swim, but the American Union is mass, another massive shallow shipwreck site with lots to see. Yeah, it's not as convenient to get to. It's one of those definitely on my list though, because just because of its location and it's it's another fairly shallow one. So for me as a paddler, I'm I'm so near it. Awesome. I'm gonna harp on this for a second and highlight your list in general. So I mean we got to highlight some really beautiful, stunning shipwrecks today. Are there some that are just absolute bucket lists, whether they're in the sanctuary or around the world? I mean, marine archaeology is such a rich field. There's so much to discover, there's so much we have no idea about. Are there places or individual ships you two are really keen on? 
the next one we discover, I would say. <laughs> awesome. Well, I love that answer, and that's fantastic. And by the way, when you go out to that that ship uh, that we've been asked about, we'll do a second broadcast. We'll just cover what that looks like too. I'm very excited. Excellent. All right. There's so many questions pouring in, plus so many people sharing their states. It's kind of hard to navigate. So I think I've got a few more that I can find really readily here, um, and we'll we'll do our best to keep you guys uh, as up to date as possible. So Doug wants to know, do you have a map of where lake access points are and maybe a list of shipwrecks that are more accessible and specific to paddling and snorkeling? So you talked about shipwrecks that are you know, a few hundred yards offshore. That's really easy for everyone, no matter what their gear is. Um, is there a list on NOAA or you guys or, or anywhere that we can find this really readily? I would say there's a couple of resources. I kind of breezed through it a little fast at the end and I apologize, but the, the US Heritage, Heritage 23, uh, website has the map of uh, the blue ways and if you google uh, alpina blue ways you'll find that map and it will have uh, some of that information another great place to go is the alpina uh, tourism bureau visit alpina.com they have a, a lot of, sh of not all the ones that i mentioned but th that we talked about today but a number of shallow shipwrecks so visit alpina.com and then look for their shallow shipwreck adventure guide and that gives you the step-by-step -step where to put in and how to get to the wrecks how cool is that there's also you know a link on NOAA the Hunter Bay national marine sanctuary site that will take you to the known shipwrecks and it gives you the depths how far from shore it is i mean it will give you all that information fantastic so all the stuff out there, Hannah can maybe put that in the chat bar as well, if it's easy to find, uh, which would yep, be great. Those links are back in the chat. Perfect, so there you go. So for everyone who wants to check it out, check in the chat bar at the bottom, uh, not the question bar, it is different from the chat bar and you'll find it there. All right, uh, we're gonna only do a few more questions as we're getting close to the end of the broadcast. So our coolest named viewer, uh, Orion, wants to know a very specific question, which is, is there a sanctuary near Whidbey Island, Washington? I don't. Personally, know where Whidbey Island is, and Hannah, you might be able to speak to this too. But Washington Islands off the coast, sanctuary is near there. Yeah, it's I believe off of Washington State, and we do have a sanctuary there. We have Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, which is on the westernmost uh, corner of Washington State. Um, very beautiful place with tidal ecosystems, so you can go there and go tide pooling. I would just check with the local counties to see their regulations on visiting during this time. Perfect. Um, all right, I love this question as sort of a wrap up question. And, and when we answer this, I'll tell you guys where some of the people are joining from because it's all over the place, it's crazy. Um, so I personally am going on my first shipwreck dive in a little bit and I'm very excited. I happen to have some friends that know what they're doing and help me with that. But our question on Slido is, is there a group to join or a type of organization that people can join if they want to see shipwrecks via paddling so they don't have to go alone? Oh, gosh. Um, I just have a quick answer. I am a part, a member of a couple of Facebook groups. Uh, Great Lakes, you know, Michigan Paddling is one, and um, Great Lakes Shipwreck History. And I, that's how I connect with, with different folks that are doing those shallow adventures. I, Leslie, do you have any better answers? You know, I find it right in within my own social circle. Oftentimes we don't talk about those things, but we all end up having access to a kayak or a paddle board. You may have more people within your social circle than you know that has access to those things. Fantastic. Thanks, ladies. So lots of opportunities. Check out things near you and again, whether that's a sanctuary or maybe a local diving club, something where they can take you out. There's lots of opportunities like that. So I, I really encourage you to check out things that are local. Before we dive back in with Hannah and say a huge thank you to everyone for joining today, it is like it's madness where all of you came from. So at minimum, Michigan, California, Ontario, Iowa, Hawaii, Colorado, New York, Virginia, Georgia, New Mexico, Florida, Maine, and Indiana. Like that's the people who identified themselves. So we've got like 15, 20 states, uh, Canada as well. Really, really appreciate all you guys joining for such an exciting program. So thank you so, so much. Um, and with that, yeah, thanks for your questions. Great questions, guys. I'm sure there's opportunities that we can share more online as well. And I'll turn it back to Hannah to, again, wrap us up. Awesome. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you, all of you from everywhere who've tuned in. I want to remind you that you have local water bodies near you that you could paddle on to get started. And then when you're ready to travel on up to Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary to check out some shipwrecks, you'll have some paddling experience underway. 
speaking of paddling, recreating in sanctuaries, today I'm going to share with you a brief video about an upcoming series of live events. It's going to be called Virtual Get Into Your Sanctuary yeah, Weekend. It's going to be next weekend. And I'm going to share this video here, um, giving you a little bit more information about the upcoming weekend, starting now. All right, so that gives you an idea of what you could see during these live interactions. We're going to be visiting all of our sites on social media, on Facebook, either through a Facebook Live or a Facebook Watch Party that weekend. I'm going to switch over to sharing my presentation to give you the link information here in a second. Um, and before we get to get into your sanctuary, I wanted to let you know that this recording, as well as all of our other live interactions with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, will be found on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube channel. We have a playlist on their channel called NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So please check out that playlist to see this recording and all of our previous Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants programs, including, I believe, two others specifically on Thunder Bay. So here's the link for Get Into Your Sanctuary Weekend, although if you follow us on Facebook, you'll find the information there as well. And if you're also interested in more live interactions, like the one today, we have a full moon watch party with NOAA's Deeper Dive webinar series that's going to be highlighting sanctuaries on August 3rd, right after Get Into Your Sanctuary Weekend. Um, and these are all of the links that you can find there. The last um, webinar live interaction series I can mention is the one that's geared for educators, also run by the sanctuary system, and you get a certificate for professional development if you attend one of these as well. And with that, I want to say thank you to everybody who participated today, all of the attendees, both Leslie and Stephanie, for giving a great and really unique presentation about Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary and what it's like to be a paddler there. Um, if you are interested and an adult in taking the distance learning survey, this helps us figure out how we want to tailor our live interactions in the future. This survey will pop up as soon as we end today's webinar. So if you're interested in providing your input, we would really, really appreciate it. That being said, um, that's all I have to share today. And I want to thank you all again. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Leslie. And thank you, Jesse, for being a great host. All right, this concludes today's webinar.